I have the pleasure of being here in sort of two capacities, although one more, really more than the other. Um, as a as a uh, as a professional, I am lucky enough to work for an organization that is extremely supportive of diversity and inclusion as a as a business imperative. <clears throat> And part of that part of that job helped me come in contact with uh, with Quaker and with the episodic disability um, uh, movement, and I, I have the pleasure of being able to uh, to help them and promote uh, what they're doing uh, through my company, which is uh, which is really a, a, a great thing to do. But I also am very excited by the contact with this organization because I'm also a person who lives with a disability on a day-to-day -day basis. And that disability isn't your traditional disability. I don't, um, I don't have a wheelchair. I don't um, have a guide dog. I, I don't fit any of those sort of typical traditional disabilities that, uh, that people think of when we talk about persons with disabilities generally. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a bit about <clears throat> what, my, uh, what my experience was and what the gaps were in terms of rehabilitation and treatment that I experienced, and then what it's um, been like being back at work and living with that disability um, on a on a day-to-day -day basis, and how my employer has uh, helped in that respect. So I'm 40, and when I was um, I don't know where, where you know, this is 2006, so. Four years ago, it's been four years. See, now that the fact that I can't remember is a good thing. Um, four years ago, I hit rock bottom in the absolute worst way you could possibly do. Um, I literally became so um, dysfunctional that I was almost catatonic. Ended up in the hospital and was admitted to uh, the psychiatric ward at Mount Sinai for three weeks. I'm a lawyer. I'm professional, I'm a mother, I'm a wife, daughter, sister, you name it, and was um, really, you know, at the peak of my career. To go from that high functioning to no functioning was probably the most dramatic thing I've ever gone through in my life. Damned scary, in fact. Three weeks, um, it took me to become functional enough that I could get myself out of bed, I could uh, remember to wash my face and brush my teeth, to get myself on medication, to get some kind of control over what I was doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And in the hospital they have great care. If you're acutely ill and you need to be, if somebody determines you need to be admitted, you get great care. There are nurses there 24, hour, 24 hours a day, you get a, a psychiatric um, appointment every day, so you're talking to someone who's in, analyzing what's going on with you. Um, you get any kind of medication that they think is necessary. Someone cooks for you. So, you know, it, it's really great care. So after three weeks, I was determined to be functional enough that I could be um, discharged and, and sent home. And that, in many ways, was like being dropped off a cliff. So first I hit rock bottom, <laughs> and then we pulled them up a little bit. And then they sort of dropped me off a cliff because I went from 24-hour care with um, a specialist attending to uh, the, the kinds of things I needed to absolutely no care at all. And my husband works. Uh, I don't have family in the, in the city, and my daughter goes to school. So I was at home alone with no care whatsoever in an extremely vulnerable state. And within about three or four weeks, I was darn close to needing to be hospitalized again. In those three or four weeks, my husband was on the phone continuously trying to find um, anybody who had an opening for uh, one of the psychiatrists, um, any kind of interim support that we could get that didn't cost an arm and a leg. And I think the only saving grace was that my mother-in-law picked up and came and, and literally stayed with me for five weeks. And I don't know that we exchanged more than about 500 words in those in that entire time. But she just literally kept me company and kept me from doing or say, you know, something that was, uh, was not in my best interest or my family's best interest. Um, I had gotten, again, so bad just before she came that my, my husband had taken me to Cam H. Um, to visit one of the social workers because he just he didn't know what to do. 
and this was affecting how often he was getting to work on time. Um, my daughter was, she was only three at the time, and he literally kind of went, uh, you know, I need to have her admitted again, or like, I just don't know what to do. And God bless this social worker because she bent over backwards to find somebody to, um, uh, you know, evaluate my case. And she, despite her incredibly overworked schedule, um, fit me in for counseling on a weekly basis. And I'm lucky enough to work for an employer who has a really incredible employee assistance program. So I, I found another counselor through them. And between those two counselors who are only giving me supportive counseling, not therapeutic counseling. So this is just trying to keep you functioning from day to day, not trying to help you get better. Between those two, I managed for almost nine months before I finally got into a psychiatrist and therapeutic care. In that time, I managed to work my way back into work. So it took me about six months. I was off completely for three months. And then I started with literally a couple of hours a week. <laughs> and I worked my way up little by little, trying to get back to work. My colleagues and my boss were extraordinary. They were very clear that I should only come back if I felt I was well enough to be there and that I could take on whatever work I felt I was capable of doing. So after six months, I was actually back full-time at work, but I still didn't have therapeutic care. That only came a couple of months later. Once I got into therapeutic care, my ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis got significantly better very quickly. If I had had that when I left the hospital, I probably would have been back at work in a couple of months. So big, big, big difference uh, in terms of your productivity and your ability to function and your contribution to the workforce and to your family and your community when there's that kind of gap in access to care. So I'm now, I've been back at work, like I said, for four years. Um, <clears throat> I have moved from, I was um, working in the, the legal department and at the bank and I'm now in corporate HR and I have the pleasure of, of managing the diversity and inclusion portfolio at Scotia Bank, which is is a real melding of sort of my personal experience, not only through this, but uh, you know, my, my previous work experience and the issue. And what it's, uh, what I promised myself when I was listening to my husband argue on the phone with numerous people about where he could get access to care, um, I thought when I'm better, I'm, I have to speak out about this because God help somebody who goes through this and doesn't have a husband like I do doesn't have a mother-in-law who can pick up and come, doesn't have some social worker who bends over backwards like she did, doesn't have an employer who has a great uh, employee benefits program, doesn't have an employer who really, or a, a boss who really, you know, understood and, and went the distance for me. I had all those factors and I still had a poor experience and a difficult experience. I can't imagine what it'd be like to not have any of that. And I've seen that happen with a number of the employees at Scotiabank who are living alone. They don't have, you know, a, an advocate, a family advocate who can help them. And episodic disabilities in particular are really difficult to, ad it's hard to advocate for yourself because the periods of, un of unwellness or illness really take a toll on your ability to, um, to be a, an assertive person in the medical um, or organization. And in this healthcare system, you have to be assertive and you have to be an advocate. So if you don't have someone doing that for you, you're already at a disadvantage. So I've now been um, living with, um, I, I have major depression and general anxiety and it's unpredictable. That's more than anything is the key to it. I can make it less unpredictable the more I understand what kinds of things make it difficult for me to function or what kinds of things will trigger an episode, so to speak. But I don't have full control over that, never will, and that's a really hard thing to accept when you're used to having control over your life and um, what you do and say. You know, the, the old immortal 22-year-old vision of the world that you know, everything, you, you can live and die and, and do whatever you want to without uh, a lot of consequence. When you live with an episodic disability, everything you do affects whether or not you are likely to have an episode or not. What you eat, how much sleep you get in particular, um, whether there are family stressors, uh, whether you have no family to rely on at all, 
how good is your friend and professional network, what's your access to care, is there appropriate medication that uh, will help manage your particular disability, um, and not just one that you can take forever, but they keep coming up with new things, and you know, when you change medication, that's a whole other issue. So, to the extent that I have some kind of control on all of those issues, I manage fairly well at work. And probably the last year has been the best that I've managed so far because I haven't had any extended periods where I've needed to, to be off. Um, I've had probably two or three periods of two to three weeks in the last four years where I was just completely non-functional again. Not as far down as I was, but clearly not able to concentrate, you know, be at work. Um, you have very little motivation, frankly, for getting out of bed. So for me, not being able to get out of bed is, pretty, is a pretty bad day. And I sort of have three ranges. Not getting out of bed, getting out of bed but working at home, and then making it to work and, and you know, managing through the day. I can't imagine what it would have been like trying to manage my, to keep my job, honestly, if I hadn't had the boss I did and the employer I do. So my boss was very, very clear that um, I was valuable, that my health was paramount, what, that he would help with anything I needed to, to get help with, so any of the policies at work or, or that kind of thing, and um, that any work that I could contribute was also valued. So it didn't, there wasn't a volume issue or a time issue or any of that kind of thing, and that, that just gave me so much encouragement to do my best to help myself get rehabilitated. I've now changed bosses. <clears throat> I have an equally understanding boss, and I didn't change bosses without sourcing that first, because that, uh, that has become a really critical factor to me. You know, my bosses need to know everything about my, you know, my day-to-day -day management, that kind of thing, although I'm, I'm probably more open than your, your average person. But um, he needed to know that there are going to be mornings when I might call and say, you know, it's just not, it's not working this morning. <laughs> and it's not because I have a really bad cold or the flu or, you know, your traditional sick stuff. It's, it's because I am not functioning at a level that's uh, appropriate for being in the workplace. And my presence in the workplace when I'm not functioning very well is really kind of detrimental. Because people worry about you and, you know, that kind of thing. So it's not really great for me to be there when I'm not functioning very well. It's, but there are times when I can work at home. I'm just, I'm really not presentable. <laughs> In, you know, in that, in that sort of way. So what I've come to understand is there's, there's, there's not necessarily a really hard and fast boundary between what I need to tell my boss for him to understand what to expect from me and, um, you know, what he doesn't really need to know. But what it comes down to for me is absolutely proactive um, management of my day-to-day uh, -day living. So as part of my job, I often end up going to evening events that are part of diversity. In fact, I'm going to one tonight. I know that when I stay up late and I don't go to bed at the same time, that the next morning is, is difficult. So when I have events, I take my computer home and I work at home for the next, either the whole day or the next morning. Because I, I know that sleep is a real big issue for me. Or if, you know, I, I'm out on the town or whatever, which I rarely do <laughs> anymore. Um, that happens to be one of my triggers. I also know, as I've discovered, that the dentist is a really bad trigger for me for some reason. Um, <clears throat> it, just, it just completely destroys my ability to think and do anything for the rest of the day. So I've stopped scheduling those 7.30 a.m. Uh, <laughs> dentist appointments because I don't make it through the rest. I don't make it to work after that. I now have them at the end of the day, and I've stopped taking my daughter with me to, to get her appointment done too, because I just I can't manage her and me at the same time. Uh, but I, I had to learn from that experience. <laughs> I called work and went, I'm not going back to work. Going straight home to bed. Um, I really have to watch my diet. That you know, is, it has a very significant effect on my mental health. And you know, I, re I really have to pay attention to what's going on in my family and, and how much responsibility I'm taking for what goes on in my family. They're all still in Alberta and, and Vancouver, so we're alone out here. And it's hard when stuff's going on and I, you can't do anything from here. 
and that really affects how I perceive things and you know my, my general functioning. I'm one of those people who has both a physical um, issue and a, an emotional um, sort of depressive behavior issue. So part of what we figured out is that I will probably have to take medication for the rest of my life and that I've been, I've been living with this disability probably since I was about eight years old. And I've gone through, I can identify episodes now as I look back through my life. And I managed them because um, I didn't know, I, I just figured that was normal up and down. <laughs> Turns out it's really not. <laughs> And I had gone through enough of those episodes and there were so many triggers and, and um, difficult things going on in my life at the time that it just it put me over the edge completely. So I clearly have a chemical issue where I don't, just don't make enough serotonin. But I, I added on to that, I've also developed very strong depressive behaviors around certain traumatic events in my life that have, have added on to that. So I've got kind of a weird combination. Some people might have an entirely chemical issue where they, they just need medication on a regular basis. And some people may not have a, a, a chemical issue. They're just, um, they've developed behaviors that uh, are in response to traumatic events in their life that they really have to unwind and figure out how to do. And I've been going to therapy every week for four years. And I now understand why people go for 10 years because uh, it took me 40 years to get the way I was and four years is not is a drop in the bucket when it comes to unwinding all of those coping mechanisms that weren't working and developing new coping mechanisms that I can use in the workplace. So if there are two things I were going to leave you with, um, one would be, I think, I, the one thing I hate more than anything is when someone says, oh, you suffer from depression. I don't suffer, I live with it. Every once in a while, I have a day when I'm suffering, yeah, but I'm not a victim in this. I have proactive management of my disability, and uh, it is not what defines me. The second thing is, when you have somebody in your workplace who lives with an episodic disability, and everything that Martina said about um, the traditional view of disability and how uh, all of the different factors that can affect someone's um, participation in work and life. Two of the things that I think are really important from an employer perspective to understand is that if you have an employee with an episodic disability, you have to understand that no matter how much control they try to have over their life and, and how that affects them, they don't have control over two things. They don't have control necessarily over access to care. So you may have somebody in your workplace who desperately wants to get better, is ready for rehabilitation, but cannot get those services. That, more than anything, is what makes me want to be an advocate because I just think that's uh, unacceptable in so many ways. <laughs> so you may have someone who is struggling to get access to care and still trying to come to work. Because, and then the whole other side of that is whether or not they, have, they could be off work and still have an income. So they might be a sole breadwinner. They you know, might be a dual income earner, but they, both, they need both incomes. So that tension between knowing what you probably need, i.e. probably some time off to, to get better, and being able to take that time off with the appropriate access to care and support is a, an enormous tension for most people. The second thing is whether or not that individual has a support network at home. So are they somebody who lives alone? Are they somebody with a strong family connection? Uh, do they have a partner? Uh, whoever that person is, if they don't have someone in their life that plays that part, that just adds enormous complexity to it. And I've seen that happen over and over again with um, employees that sort of landed in the legal department because they were really unpredictable and you know having all of those issues and they had no one advocating for them. So those are background issues that you, you have very little control um, over as a person with a disability but significantly can affect your work your workplace participation. So it's not necessarily something that you can do anything about as an employer, but you can understand that those are factors that this individual doesn't have control over and it's, it, it is what it is. <laughs> it's not going to get any better until they can either get access to care, access to medication, or that kind of thing. Um, that's pretty much all I had to say. Um, are we going to wait for questions afterwards? Or?
Um, are there any burning questions at the moment, or <laughs> otherwise we can uh, we can move on? Yes, sir. I just I think you maybe touched on it, but um, presumably we also have to be very conscious of uh, those who are the support network, because mm -hmm. particularly given difficulty in getting access to care, often that support network is. Uh, having to take time off of work oh, yeah. <laughs> in order to support. Extremely well, good point. It's, yeah. it's a team situation. Well, I'll tell you what happened to my husband, the, the company he was working at, who happened to be an HR company, which is, is very ironic. Um, he, was, he was bringing his laptop home and he was working from home because he, he was scared to leave me alone in, in a lot of uh, cases. And he was very upfront with him. You know, my, my wife's in the hospital. I have a three-year-old. We don't have family. You know, he, he let them know what the situation was. And after a couple of weeks, they took him into the office and, and told him that uh, if he didn't start uh, putting 100, they were paying him for 100% participation. If he didn't start um, showing 100% participation in the workplace, that he was going to lose his job. Fabulous. <laughs> Just what he needed to hear when his wife was as ill as she was and a three-year-old who uh, needed him and was, uh, you know, uh, thought it was her fault that mommy was in the hospital. That, that's just ridiculous. So, you know, in, in, at the bank often we have people who ha are both working at the bank. So we take care to, do, do we have a partner in the bank and, you know, do we need to pay attention to both of those hiring managers so they make sure that they're, you know, they understand they have a spouse who's in, in difficulties. So in terms of, very disturbing in terms of access, and, and I don't know that there's a, an easy answer, but as employers, um, are there supports for employers and resources for us to assist employees in gaining access to assistance? Um. As employers, uh, as managers, um, I would get really well acquainted with whatever your company offers. So um, most large companies or, or public service have employee assistance programs of some sort. Get really well acquainted with that. Understand what services are available. So if you have an employee in trouble, you can say, you know what, there's this service, you, you know, you're, you're able to, to pull those up quickly. Um, but part of what the Episodic Disabilities Network is doing is to try and put all of those other services and supports together in one place so that you as the employer could go, you know, we're going we're gonna to sit down and we're going to look at this, at this portal and find something that will help you. Because right now, it's hard. First of all, well, I, I just want to say I really I admire your, your ability to talk to us about this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm a new manager here. and, and I have quite a few actually issues which are not visible and probably no one in the department knows about what the other person is suffering, but I had a number of people who came out um, with a number of diseases, so, so I'm just mm -hmm. uh, trying to myself first of all to know how do I process that, because I find it difficult to learn about it, and then how do I uh, work with those people. Uh, on your note about access to care, I actually had a situation where we, someone couldn't bring a doctor's note. And in talking to my colleague who works uh, as an insurance agent, it turns out that the insurance companies have departments. And what they do, the only thing that those departments do is they say they chase the doctors because they cannot have doctor's notes to the insurance company. So if the insurance company cannot get the doctor to respond, how can a sick person exactly. get a doctor to respond? Mm -hmm. And you were talking about yourself about well-educated person having all access. When someone who is not that well-educated to begin with... It scares me. I mean, they're out, they are really out of luck. But uh, what I wanted to ask you, if you have a moment to tell us, what are the things that can be, that, that are wrong, that people could do uh, to, to make the case uh, be worse? In other, in other hmm. words, uh, with, with the best intentions or without much thinking about it. Mm -hmm. so just like you said, well, we don't suffer, we we'll live with something. Mm. A little thing like that changes. Um, yeah. Right. But, um, is there anything else that you can tell us? You need to look at, well, what really are they not executing on? Is it touching on those really essential things and I need to have day, you know, done day to day? A uh, good example is our, our balancing teller in, in a branch. 
you, we need that person to execute the balance at the end of the day. That's a bank act where like the 20 different regulators require that. If someone has MS and their, uh, their cognitive memory and their, their ability to, to um, process transaction, tra transactional relationships is impaired, you have somebody who's not going to be able to execute that essential duty. So unless you understand what the essential uh, components of are your, of your jobs, it's going to be difficult to, to go to someone and say, not what's affecting you and what are you living with and, you know, you know tell me about it. That's not what you need to do. What you need to do is say, here are the essential things that I need you to do every day. Um, are you having trouble with any of those? And if you are, is there something different we can do that will help you execute those duties? Um, are, are, you know, are, there, are you attending medical treatment? Is, there, is that a regular thing? Do you need time in order to get to that medical treatment? Whatever that is. Um, most people who have episodic disabilities have regular treatment of some sort. So I go every Wednesday to um, my therapist and my boss knows that I'm not available during that time. Um, he doesn't know who my doctor is or any of that kind of stuff. He knows that, that but that's a really important element to me to be able to continue to function in my essential duties at work. So the conversation is about, here are the things I need you to do. If you're having difficulty executing those, then what do we need to do to help you? And if there isn't anything that we can do to help you, then we're in a different situation. Then that's about, okay, are you in a job that you can continually do on a regular basis, and you might not be? Um, or do you, is this an appropriate time where we need to talk about um, time off or flexible work. Flexible work is like the biggest gift any corporation can give to its employees. Um, so promoting the understanding of flexible work as well and how does flexible work with essential duties. So does it matter when or how that work gets done? In most cases, it honestly doesn't unless you're a call center employee or you know, who has set shifts where you need to be in front of a customer. Then it matters where the job is done. But if, if you only care that the job gets done, and it gets done in a quality fashion, and you meet the deadlines you need, then does it matter if someone works from 10 to 8, or 10 to 6, or from 7 to 3, or at home, or do they have the technology to do that? It's really about getting people to get past that. I need to see somebody in the office on a regular basis. And it's also um, what I've realized, and I didn't mention this actually, and I forgot about it. Um, the real trouble with managing episodic disabilities, or the difficulty of managing episodic disabilities in the workplace, is that we are not only, from a societal perspective, um, programmed to expect predictability from people, because predictability breeds consistency, breeds trust. Right? If someone's unpredictable, it's hard to trust them. We are also genetically coded that way. So as, a, as an animal in the world, we are genetically programmed to look for predictable patterns that will help us manage our survival. So both from a genetic perspective and a societal perspective, you are already at un in an uneasy position when you're dealing with someone who's unpredictable. So that, that's a really tough thing to overcome on a regular basis. But if you understand that, yeah, OK, this is it's not going to be you know, the easiest thing to do, but I can be proactive about helping the person understand what they can and, and can't do or what they can manage, you know, usually, and sometimes does not so much. And does that matter in the end? Mm -hmm. uh, just something you said there. I mean, I think it's really important as managers that we really look at flexibility for all employees. Oh, absolutely, uh, yeah. In that sense, because if you've got a fairly rigid structure, but it seemed to be special treatment of someone who uh, was in uh, this type of situation. That can be very tough with coworkers yep. as well. Absolutely. And uh, and there is, particularly with technology, um, you know, terrific opportunities to add so much more flexibility into how we approach our work. Uh, so I, I, you know, I think the the context is there to really get significant improvements on this file a lot quicker than yeah. maybe it was 10 years ago. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, we just <clears throat> we just changed our um, flexible work. We went from alternative work arrangements when it first came out to flexible work arrangements. And we were still getting feedback that arrangements really 
still gave the context of special treatment. So we've now changed to flexible work options. Option available for anybody. If it, as long as you meet business objectives, there are some jobs where flexible work is just, it's not possible because you can't do the essential duties <laughs> um, in a flexible manner. That's all there is to it. But we've really gone out hard on it's an option. And it doesn't matter why the employee wants that. If it's possible, again, doesn't matter how, when, or where that work is done, then why not? Doesn't that make sense? Uh, you get much more engaged people. Um, and you get really loyal and engaged people who have episodic disabilities and have a flexible workplace. I can guarantee you that. That's been the subject of conversation for the last four years with my psychiatrist. So the question was, was there anything that I could have done differently before I hit rock bottom? Um, absolutely. Uh, I think what, you know, there are numerous things when I, when I think about the way I was managing my life. I overcommitted myself. I expected myself to be the perfect wife, the perfect mother, the perfect employee, the perfect, you know. And that's just an unacceptable standard. It's not attainable. So I've backed off of that. I know, you know, I'm, I have a much better uh, view about what I'm capable of and what my, I'm capable of committing to. And I was only capable of committing to do this kind of thing in the last six months. So it took me three and a half years to get there. Um, what I did have a chat with my colleagues and my employer about um, was that I had had a, a couple of episodes at work. Uh, previous to this where I sort of you know fallen apart and then got myself back together and you know when you when you when you work in a high pressure environment that happens you know some people it just you have a bad day um, but I had had a couple that were really similar and so we had I had a chat with my colleagues and, and said you know um, we have to look out for each other because we are all running at full tilt and uh, we don't always stop to take care of ourselves and we need to pay attention, more attention to each other. And, and they, all of them recognized that, you know, when that happened and when that happened, that was awfully similar. And so we sort of agreed that, you know, we're going to keep an eye out on each other. And, and if we see somebody responding that way, it's like, okay, is this just a bad day? Or what else is going on in your life? Because there isn't balance there. And balance isn't 50-50. It's about what, you know, what balance amongst all the things in your life that you do makes sense for you in the circumstances and some people have bigger capacity than others uh, you know what they always say give if you want something done give it to a busy person mm -hmm. <laughs> I was that person <laughs> I'm no longer that person um, and I do that deliberately because I refuse to surrender my mental health to that extreme again and I just will not go there mm -hmm. so um, I think co-workers are and you're sometimes more than the managers because you know managers are a particular level you don't necessarily see what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis but your coworkers are really critical people because they see you often sometimes more than your family does. So they know what the ups and downs are. And if you're, you're looking out for each other, it doesn't have to be, you know, what's wrong. It's not about what's wrong. It's what's going on. Like, you know, is it, did something happen? Did you just not sleep? Like, what, what's going on that, you know, you're responding in this way that doesn't really make sense because I know you well enough to know that that's not usual response <laughs> for you. So I, I think that um, that really stood up for me, you know. And my husband was just too deep into it to be able to, you know, to see that. Um, you know, the, the things that I could do differently really have to do with, you know, up here. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how you perceive yourself and how I balanced my life. My life was not balanced at all. So. Thank you. <laughs> could you um, comment or share on some strategies how you can engage your coworkers? Uh, because you you know I think you raised some really excellent points, but for those because there are there are privacy concerns uh, for those who might have the perception of, you know that you're not fulfilling your duties and that they may be having to pick up um, you know when they've got a lot on their plate uh, you know how you can have a you know a healthy productive workplace when there are perceptions, as, as Don said, you know, there could be some special treatment, for example. So what are some of the strategies that, that, that you have found to be helpful to engage the, the, the co-workers to have a really productive workplace? Actually, I think that's an awfully good segue into, into what Melissa's talking about. So thank you. I will pass it over to her.